Good morning. We've been uh, looking together at the story of Job and about suffering and pain and how there's a thread that runs through suffering and pain. And last week we saw the first piece of that invisible thread and lament as we cry out to God in our pain and in our misery. And today we're going to look at the second piece of that kind of that thread, and that's called waiting, wondering why. Why is this happening to me? And David calls our attention to that in Psalm 40, when he says, I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. He drew me up from the desolate pit, out of the miry bog, and set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Oftentimes in the midst of pain and suffering and loss, it does feel like a desolate pit. It does feel like a miry bog. Get stuck. And we wait for God to move and to act. And in waiting, we trust that he loves us and cares for us. We're going to begin uh, our, continue our worship by singing, uh, God is here. And we're going to stand and sing that together. and welcomes us with these words, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Friends, the peace of Christ be with you.
the presence of a present God, we draw close to the mystery of faith, love that cannot be undone by anything that we do. Trusting that God is grace, let us offer to God the truth of our lives, first through song and then a moment of silent prayer. Let's sing together.
The psalmist says, The Lord is faithful in all his words and gracious in all his deeds. The Lord upholds all who are falling and raises up all who are bowed down. Go forth to live in that peace. Amen. We rise together as we prepare our hearts to hear God's word by singing, Lord, listen to your children praying. Please pray with me. Loving and gracious God, our hearts cry out in the midst of pain, in the midst of sorrow, in the midst of all the pain we see in the world around us today. And we wonder how long. And we wonder sometimes what possible good could there be in all of this hurt, in all of this sorrow not only in our own lives, but in the world around us. What possible good is there? Speak to us today through your Holy Spirit and Word. Talk to us. Encourage us. Empower us. In Jesus' name, amen. The scripture lesson today is found in the book of Job which we are looking at his life, and we are going to read um, chapter 11. You know, Job's friends came and sat with him for seven days and were silent in the midst of his suffering, in the midst of his pain. They didn't say a word for seven days. And God's whole view of that was that the best thing they ever did. Once they opened their mouths, everything fell apart. So often the case, right? Well, one of these opens his mouth as Zophar, and that's what we're going to read in chapter 11. We hear God's word. Then Zophar, the Naamathite, answered, Should a multitude of words go unanswered? And should one full of talk be vindicated? Should your babble put others to silence? This is what you need to hear when you're suffering, right? Just what you need to hear. And when you mock, shall no one shame you? For you say, my conduct is pure, and I am clean in God's sight. But oh, that God would speak and open his lips to you, that he would tell you the secrets of wisdom, for wisdom is many-sided. Know then that God exacts of you less than your guilt deserves. Can you find out the deep things of God? Can you find out the limit of the Almighty? It is higher than heaven. What can you do? Deeper than Sheol. What can you know? Its measure is longer than the earth and broader than the sea. If he passes through an imprison and assembles for judgment, who can hinder him? For he knows who those who are worthless. When he sees iniquity, will he not consider it? But a stupid person will get understanding when a wild ass is born human. If you direct your heart rightly, you will stretch out your hands toward him. If an iniquity is in your hand, put it far away, and do not let wickedness reside in your tents. Surely then you will lift up your face without blemish. You will be secure and will not fear. You will forget your misery 
You will remember it as waters that have passed away, and your life will be brighter than the noonday. Its darkness will be like the morning, and you will have confidence because there is hope. You will be protected and take your rest in safety. You will lie down and no one will make you afraid. Many will entreat your favor, but the eyes of the wicked will fail. All way of escape will be lost to them, and their hope is to breathe their last. This is the word of the Lord. God. We're talking about, what, about uh, suffering and pain, and today we're thinking about waiting. That invisible thread that runs through suffering and pain that starts with lament when we cry out to God honestly about what we're experiencing. And that invisible thread moves to waiting because we want to enlarge our souls in suffering and pain. Not try to get over it, rather, we want, we want to absorb it into our life so that our soul expands so that we'll have greater love and compassion for all people. We talked last week about lament, where we give voice to our pain and sadness, where we enter into the darkness of letting grief and loss into our souls and we cry out to God. Today, we ask that question, we want to know Why? As we cry out to God, why am I going through this? For what purpose? Because what even makes it harder to understand is that we're told in Scripture that in all things God works for the good of those who love him. Where's the good? In, in 40 years of ministry, countless people have asked that, and I ask that myself of God. Where's the good? What possible good could there be? It doesn't make sense that a drunk driver killed my daughter. A parishioner asks me that. What good is that? What good is it that a disease comes out of nowhere in the middle of the night and my four-year-old daughter dies? What good is in that? How do you make sense of a flood literally wiping out a home? What's the good purpose of my losing a job or a career, being paralyzed, having an amputation, or coming down with Alzheimer's? Where, where is the good in it? I don't see it. And giving voice to the pain and sadness and lament, we want to know why. What's the purpose? Where is the good? We cry out, and God seems quiet. There's no quick, easy answer like his friends had. We're told to be patient, to wait. Psalm 37, 7 says, Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. That sounds like good advice for others, but not for me. <laughs> I'm not so patient. We dislike waiting. You know, in the midst of deep loss and of suffering, we want, well, what's next? How do, I, how do I even go on? Does the pain ever go away? Somebody asks me. You know, the pain never goes away. It's maybe not as sharp as in the beginning. But it never goes away. And Job wondered, he cried out, God, what's going on? What, why am I going through this? And initially, like I said, his friends sat in silence with him seven days and seven nights. It's so good, they simply sat. But when Job began to lament, when he began to cry out and he began to ask God's questions, and he was brutally honest, God, I don't understand what's going on in my life. I don't even know who you are. I don't even know who you are. And the friends <laughs> began to answer. They began to defend God, it seems. They, they too wanted to make sense of it. And so Zophar comes in Job chapter 11. 
In verse 13 to 16, it says, If you direct your heart rightly, Job, you will stretch out your hands toward him. If iniquity is in your hand, put it far away, and do not let wickedness reside in your tents. Surely then you will lift up your face without blemish. You will be secure and will not fear. You will forget your misery. You will remember it as waters that have passed away. Job, here it is. Your problems, your sufferings are rooted in your sin. You sin, you suffer. Since this is a really big suffering, Job, you must have really sinned big. All you need to do is repent. Confess your sin, and your life will be blessed, and you will be happy. That's what he says in verse 17. Your life will be brighter than the noonday. Its darkness will be like the morning. You'll get roses and rainbows and resurrection and sunshine. It's simple. It's like an equation. You sin this much, you suffer this much. If you don't sin, or if you repent, God will love you, and your life will be brighter than the noonday. There's a lot of things you'd like to say to him in this. <laughs> Words I can't say in the pulpit, probably, but uh, it sounds like, you know what? An earthy metaphor. You know, it's always easy to see why someone else suffers, right? It's not easy at all when you suffer to understand why, what's going on. And we're called to wait to understand, waiting to have some sense for the good purpose, waiting in between the time of great loss and some sense of light, of peace. We're called to wait for the inward healing and wholeness, waiting And the one thing I did notice about Job while he's waiting, he declares that God is big. Listen, in chapter 12, verse 13, he says, To God belong wisdom and power. Counsel and understanding are his. You know, in the midst of his lament, his crying out to God, brutally honest to God, recognize he's talking to God. He didn't run away from that relationship. And in the midst of that, he's always said, God is big. I'm not. God is so big, I'm not even sure he cares about little old me. Part, it seems, of healthy waiting is humility. That God is big, I'm not. I can't understand it all. Job cried out to God in lament, why? What's happening? Job didn't quit. He kept crying out to God. He didn't stop the relationship. He was waiting. He didn't walk away from God. I can remember growing up in, in a church that uh, there was so certain that this one person was going to be healed of cancer and, and there was prayer and there was prayer meetings and everybody was so confident that he was going to be healed and, and, and they were claiming the promise and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, and, and two weeks later, he died. And the people were just devastated. People walked away from the church. When the answer didn't come that they wanted, Well, his friends, Job's friends, wanted to, to quit waiting. They gave answers. It's your fault, Job. It's your fault. You sin big, you have big suffering. That's it. That's the answer. You don't have to wait any longer. We have spoken. They wanted to fix Job and defend God. Have you ever done that? You want to fix somebody and defend God. As if God needs you to defend him. <laughs> and they tortured him. They really did torture him with their quick solutions. Get over it and move on, Job. And Job says, I can't. I can't. God is big. I don't understand. And he cried out wildly. But he was always in humility that God was big and that somehow his life was wrapped up in God. 
And God, if you don't speak, if you don't move, there's nothing. I'm going to perish. But he waited. He waited. And in that waiting, he was also trusting, it seems. Trusted somehow that his life was in God's hands. Trusted somehow that nothing could separate him from God. And, and so he was always in that relationship, trusting that there had to be a purpose, no pat answers. And sometimes in Scripture, we're given little glimpses of into why suffering comes into life. You know, one of those comes through this. There was this cosmic. There's something way beyond what we can know or understand is going on. In John 9, there's another instance given where a man was born blind and the disciples asked Jesus, who sinned, his parents or him? And Jesus said, neither. This is for the glory of God, that God's glory might be revealed. Something bigger is happening. In Romans 5, we see that suffering can, can have a constructive thing. That suffering is now meaningless. It's being used to build the life of Jesus in us, especially if we absorb it into our lives and our souls expand and we're filled with love and compassion for other people. But those are, seem too simple at times. The, the question that God is, are you going to trust me in the midst of this? Waiting and trust almost seems synonymous. Job says, though he slays me, I will trust him. I trust him. I trust him. So waiting includes humility and trust. And I think probably the key part of waiting is acceptance of mystery. Acceptance of mystery. In other words, in this life, there might not be an answer to your why. In this lifetime, there not be the, be the conclusion, this is the good that came out of my suffering and deep loss. Paul speaks to that in 1 Corinthians 13, 12. He says, now we see but a poor reflection, then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I'm fully known. Poor reflection. In part, that is what our knowing is like on earth. It's not a complete detailed description of why, but glimpses. Not the whole picture, but little snapshots. I was given the wisdom of this by someone who buried a little child. And when, when someone asked her, what, what is the good that you saw that came out of this? And this was like 10 years later. And she said, I don't know. It's kind of like every once in a while, you get like a snapshot. You see something good that came, like I can come alongside another parent who lost a child. And you can take a snapshot of that. And then there's another instance where I came along someone who was suffering and you take a snapshot of that. And you take all these little snapshots and you put them in an album. And as you flip through it, you begin to see some of the good through the years. But she says, you know, on this earth, that album will never be complete. It'll never be complete in this lifetime. It's only when you're face to face with Jesus does it even begin to make sense in the good. See, the promise and the mystery is that we might not know here on earth. We might not know. But we're given the hope and the mystery that someday, face to face with Jesus, it all will make sense. But until now, we trust. We have humility. I close with just a little story. I was a young pastor. You know, it's almost unthinkable, ungodly that at 28 I was a pastor. To be against the law. <laughs> 
Well, I did, 28. Fresh out of seminary. I knew it all. <laughs> I knew it all. In the first congregation I was serving, there was a, a beautiful young woman in her early 20s, just crazily was struck with bell palsy. And the whole side of her face just drooped. And she was devastated. And when I went to visit her, she says, why? What's going on? Of course, she can give a scientific explanation of what's going on, but what's going on here? And how do I respond? You know, Steve Brown says something once that has struck me that I've, I've, it's always stayed with me. When a young pastor was trying to tell him something and teach him something, and he told him to stop, you haven't suffered enough or sinned enough or even have an opinion about it. <laughs> I haven't suffered enough or sinned enough to even have an opinion about this. Well, you know, the thoughts go, let's see, what did John Calvin say about that? Uh, how did Martin Luther look at What's the catechism say? Uh, the Bible, you know, give answers. Like Job's friends, you want to defend God a little bit? And none of that seemed to make much sense in the face of her tears and her suffering and pain in that. And the answer I gave at 28 is still the answer I would give today. I don't know why. But the one thing I do know is that God loves you and he holds your life. It's still the answer that I give, I've given for 40 years. I don't know why. I don't know why a drunk driver kills your 20-year-old daughter don't. I don't know why a four-year-old dies in the middle of the night from encephalitis. I don't know why your son committed suicide. I don't know why there was this explosion and people died. I don't know. But I do know this, that God loves you and that he holds you and he suffers with you and he cries with you and he hurts with you. That I do know. And I've based my whole life in ministry on that. I know less than I used to when I graduated from seminary. I know less. But there's a few things that I'm so extremely confident of. And one of them is this. It's the foundation that God loves you, that God holds you no matter what you're going through in your life. His love is there. His strength is there for you. And I'm not sure the why is ever going to be answered in this lifetime. Don't know. But he never lets you go. And there is the promise that someday we'll see face to face. And we will know completely as we are completely known. But until that day, we trust in his great love and his mercy. Someone once said to me, Pastor, he said, there's got to be more than God's love that you talk about. And I looked at her and I said, Really? What would that be? Tell me. What's more important than God's love for you? And there was silence. This is the place. And this is the place we experience it this morning firsthand as we celebrate together the sacrament of communion. We taste it, we touch it, we feel it, we know it, that God loves us, that God loves us.
When we think of the meaning of the sacrament today, I want us to think about mystery. I'm not going to read the usual liturgy. I want us to think about mystery. Mystery is something that I so much want in my faith life. I don't have to have six points, detailed answers to everything. Sometimes there's things you just don't understand in this life. Mystery is something that is difficult or impossible to understand or explain. How do we completely understand the cup and the bread? Jesus told us to do this. He said the bread is his body broken for the world. The cup is his blood that's shed for the world. And we were to eat the bread and drink the cup as a way of remembering God's great eternal love. How do we understand the mystery of being loved by God who created the world and all that's in it, a big God, yet knows us by name? The mystery of how Jesus, God's Son, came to earth to show us what God is like. If we have seen Jesus, we know what God is like. He died so that we might know a God of love, of grace and mercy and vulnerability. The mystery of being one in Jesus Jesus is the one we center on and seek to live his life in this world. The mystery of being filled with Jesus' life through the Holy Spirit. The mystery that the Holy Spirit is present in this supper we celebrate so that we do partake of the life of Jesus. The mystery that Jesus unites us all in one body with love as a unifying force as we celebrate the supper. The mystery that the hard things of life will be turned to some good as the heart of the cross was turned to the good in the resurrection of Jesus. And the mystery that our physical death is a transition, knowing that for now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part, then I will know fully, even as I have been fully Today we come to celebrate the mystery. And children are welcome to receive communion at the discretion of parents and guardians. There are children present who do not yet participate in communion. We invite them to come forward for a blessing with their arms crossed in front of their bodies. It's going to be two stations for communion, one in the right aisle and one in the left. When you come forward, take a portion of bread and dip it in the cup. And if you wish to remain seated and not come forward, an elder will come to you. And also we'll provide for a time of prayer with anointing of oil. Anyone who desires to have that, you could come into the middle aisle and uh, we will pray with you and anoint you with oil at that time. Let's pray together. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Holy and right it is, and our joyful duty to give thanks to you at all times and in all places, O Lord, our Creator, Almighty and everlasting God. You created heaven with all its hosts and the earth with all its plenty. You have given us life and being and preserve us by your providence. But you have shown us the fullness of your love in sending into the world your Son, Jesus Christ, the eternal word made flesh for us and for our salvation, for the precious gift of this mighty Savior who has reconciled us to you. We praise you and bless you, O God. With your whole church on the earth and with all the company of heaven, we worship and adore your glorious name. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, all thy works shall praise thy name in earth and sky and sea. Holy, 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 mercy.
Most righteous God, we remember in this supper the perfect sacrifice offered once on the cross by our Lord Jesus Christ for the sin of the whole world. In the joy of his resurrection and in expectation of his coming again, we offer ourselves to you as living and holy sacrifices. Together we proclaim the mystery of the faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Send your Holy Spirit upon us, we pray, that the bread which we break and the cup which we bless may be to us the communion of the body and blood of Christ. Grant that being joined together in him, we may attain to the unity of the faith and grow up in all things into Christ our Lord. And as this grain has been gathered from many fields into one loaf, and as these grapes from many hills into one cup, grant, O Lord, that your whole church may be soon gathered from the ends of the earth into your kingdom. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. The Lord Jesus, the same night that he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples, saying to them, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After the same manner also, he took the cup when they had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Come, for all things are now ready. Thank you. 
Please pray with me. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. We praise and thank you, O Lord, that you have fed us at your table. Grateful for your gifts and mindful of the communion of your saints, we offer to you our prayers for all people. God of compassion, we remember before you the poor and the afflicted, the sick and the dying, prisoners and all who are lonely, the victims of war, injustice, and inhumanity, and all others who suffer from whatever their sufferings may be called. O Lord of Providence, who holds the destiny of the nations in your hand, we pray for our country. Inspire the hearts and minds of our leaders that they, together with all our nation, may first seek your kingdom and righteousness so that order, liberty, and peace may dwell with your people. O God, the Creator, we pray for all nations and peoples. Take away the mistrust and lack of understanding that divide your creatures. Increase in us the recognition that we are all your children. O Savior God, we look upon, look upon your church and its struggle upon the earth. Have mercy on its weakness. Bring to an end its unhappy divisions and scatter its fears. Look also upon the ministry of your church. Increase its courage, strengthen its faith, and inspire its witness to all people, even to the ends of the earth. Author of grace and God of love, send your Holy Spirit's blessing to your children here present. Keep our hearts and thoughts in Jesus Christ, your Son, our only Savior, who taught us to pray, saying, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We come in gratitude because God has given his love first. One of the primary teachings in Scripture is that God loved us first. It is the essential primary love. And we can only love because he loved us. And because of that, we're filled with gratitude. He loved us first. And we give our gifts, not only in using our spiritual gifts in the life of the body, but also our financial gifts. And so I invite you to stand and sing with me the doxology as those financial gifts are brought forward. Tolzma as Vice President of Consistory has some words to share with us. Also, just a reminder that tonight is the third of the roundtable discussions. I invite you to come and to share in that time together. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'm here again uh, to provide you another update on the ARC OC pastoral search process. We know you're interested and we previously committed to keep you informed on the search process and as such we're keeping our word This is to inform you that we have established an AROC Pastoral Search Committee. For your information and awareness, the following persons have graciously agreed to serve as that Pastoral Search Committee. Scott Culpepper, Kelsey Callens, Al Perno, 
Craig Kibbling, Deb Anderson, Cambria Kalwasser, Lizzie Rice, and Mark Belton. So firstly, a sincere thank you to Scott, Kelsey, Al, Craig, Deb, Cambria, Lizzie, and Mark for their willingness to serve. We greatly appreciate your willingness to take on this task and are deeply appreciative of your willingness to serve. So sincerely, on behalf of the ARC consistory and congregation, thank you. We give you our blessing and wish you Godspeed as you embark on this journey together on behalf of American Reformed Church. To you, the ARCOC congregation, please continue to pray for the ARCOC pastoral search process and specifically please pray for these individuals as they represent us in this important task. The ARCOC consistory and or a member of the ARCOC Pastoral Search Committee are committed and will continue to provide you updates on the pastoral search process as appropriate. Along those lines, I'm asking that we provide the members of the ARCOC Pastoral Search Committee the appropriate support. What do I mean by that? Please pray for them. Please stay engaged in the process. But respect them and trust the process. As previously stated, we're committed to provide you updates as appropriate on the process. However, we also need to trust and respect the process, the time and energy it's going to require, and the confidential nature of this process. In other words, and again, please trust the process and provide them the space and time they're gonna need to conduct and complete this important work for which they are charged. In closing, thank you again to Scott, Kelsey, Al, Craig, Deb, Cambria, Lizzie, and Mark for your willingness to serve on this search committee. And thank you, the people of American Reformed Church, for your continued prayers and engagement as we continue in this journey together. Grace and peace be with you. We continue our response by singing together, I'll Not Be Shaken.
receive God's blessing. May the grace of God deeper than our imagination, the strength of Christ stronger than our need, and the communion of the Holy Spirit richer than our togetherness, guide and empower us today and in all our tomorrows. Amen. Amen.